My name is Elizabeth Ho and I'm director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre at the University of South Australia and your host for this evening. On behalf of the university and the centre, I really want to thank you most sincerely for coming to our occasional lecture tonight. We are really delighted by the response. We practice respect for humanity and all cultures in our university. And we are very glad of such a large and diverse audience for a lecture about peace. Can I note this session is being recorded for public broadcast and for our website as a podcast for those who've been unable to attend or if you want to go back and listen. I'd now like to begin by inviting our supporter and friend, Uncle Lewis O'Brien, to give our Ghana welcome to country. Thank you, Lewis. Maruichanga, Ghana Miyana no Wangani, Mani to Budni Ghani Atana, Nai Birko, Mankalankala, Tandanya, Mianaku, Naita Yungandalia, Naita Yakanandalia, Padni Adlu Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do this ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. I like this little story. There's a little girl drawing in the corner and the teacher said to her, what are you drawing, dear? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, oh, we don't know what God looks like. She said, you will in a minute. <laughs> Uncle Lewis never disappoints us, thank you. <laughs> I have a few acknowledgements to make for special guests this evening. His Excellency, Rear Admiral Kevin Scarce, Governor of South Australia and Patron-in-Chief of the Hawke Centre, and Mrs Liz Scarce have joined us tonight and we're most grateful that they've given us their time. Thank you. <laughs> the Honourable Jennifer Rankin, Minister for Families and Communities, Minister for Housing, Minister for Ageing and Minister for Disabilities, Senator-elect Ms Penny Wright from the Australian Greens, Mr Stephen Marshall, Member for Norwood, Adelaide City Councillor Sue Clearahan, Dr Ian Gould, Chancellor of the University of South Australia, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Professor Joanne Wright, and Pro-Vice-Chancellors Professors Palalualia, Nigel Ralph and Alan Evans. And finally, Ms Anne Burgess, who's Acting Commissioner for Equal Opportunity. But you are all special and we're very grateful to have such a diverse and interested audience. Before I formally introduce Dr Jill Hicks, I would like to let you know that there will be time for questions, and I underline questions rather than long statements, uh, at the close of her address. So please take a moment during the lecture to frame your question. And we will have microphones. We've got two at the top and we've got two down here. So I'll try and see if there are questions up the top. It's a little bit difficult at the moment, but I'll look out for you. I'd also like to ask that if you wish to make a donation to MAD for Peace, you've been given a form, and this can be left with Hawke Centre volunteers at the door on departure. I take this moment to thank those volunteers and also Louise Carnell from my office for their efforts tonight. And I'd like to note uh, finally, that there will be a follow-up session to Jill's presentation that reflects our Hawke Centre agenda of Think, Connect, Act. One of the strategies that Jill will talk about tonight is on the topic of mad nests. These are about building a local, national and global network connecting people who believe that peace is achievable through choice. There will be a follow-up session to this lecture relating to this topic. It will be run on the 3rd of May between 6 and 7.30 in the Hawke Centre and information will be up on our website for anybody in the audience who'd like to follow up on that opportunity. And now my great pleasure to introduce Jill to you. Jill Hicks founder of the charitable organisation Mad for Peace, was, as we all know, severely injured in the London bombings, losing both legs below the knee. 
Originally from Adelaide, Jill has lived in London, and at the time of the bombings, she was head of curation at the Design Council. In 2008, she carried the Olympic torch in Canberra and walked, I underline walked, from Leeds to London as part of Walk Talk, an initiative that she co-devised to bring communities together. She has an MBE for services to charity, an honorary doctorate from the London Metropolitan University, and in 2009 was given the award of Australian of the Year in the UK and also Australian Woman of the Year in the UK. Her work as a peacemaker was most recently acknowledged when she became recipient of the Imam Wa Amal Special Judges Award at the 10th Annual Muslim News Awards for Excellence. This is granted to a person who draws their inspiration from the imperative to seek positive and meaningful change. Her acclaimed book, from which the title of this lecture derives, One Unknown, was shortlisted for the Mind Book of the Year in 2007 and is published by Rodale. Speaking more personally, when we think of heroes, we're inclined to think of Mount Everest or Antarctica or round the world solo voyages. When you meet Jill, you know that you are in the presence of someone who has traversed the toughest, toughest country of the mind and the body to reach a point of personal human victory. I note in passing that Jill remembers with great fondness the late Maurice de Rowan, our then Agent General for South Australia in London, who helped her to soar and who was admired by many. As a South Australian, it is heartening to know that Jill found a small corner of her homeland in the middle of London, found it uplifting, and that she's returned to us to tell a story. Thank you, Jill. Um, I must start by saying that that's one minute, 58 seconds, and it's probably the only time that I've been able to be quiet for one minute and 58 seconds and use my body to do the talking. So I'm really proud of that film because it's, um, um, I hope that you will agree, it's using my new form um, to say something very powerful in, in what I believe is a, is a very elegant way rather than being sensationalist, um, which would also be very easy to do. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by how many of you are here tonight and just thank you for giving up your time. Um, it, it means the world to me to be back home and to be here, um, but to be here standing in front of you um, at the town hall is, um, is quite incredible. And indeed to share, to share an experience and a journey that 
is unimaginable to, to many, but one that is not only based on tragedy, but on being fortunate to see and to feel the beauty, the wonder, and the brilliance of life, of us, of humanity. Um, now, I'm on best behavior tonight because, as you have witnessed, how wonderful Elizabeth Ho and the team at Hawke Centre are. And indeed, I'm back here in Adelaide, and the Governor and Mrs Scarce are here. But I'm not always on um, best behaviour. And there's a lovely little story of when I was uh, asked to give a talk for the Kent Fire and Rescue Service for their annual general meeting. And naturally, of course, they were treating me like absolute precious porcelain. And the chief's personal driver came to pick me up and he carefully put me in the car. And for any of you that know uh, the UK, the distance between London and Kent is quite considerable. And so I thought, okay, I can put up with this sort of nice treatment for a little bit, but I'm gonna wait for my moment um, to get Cheeky Jill in. And so I waited and waited and suddenly my opportunity came. And that was the driver saying, well, they're all so eager to hear what you've got to say about your experience. And I said, talk about my experience? What? Why, why would I want to talk about that? I'm a jazz singer. I thought I was booked to do a gig. Um, <laughs> So as he pulled over to ring the fire chief, I said, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just winding you up. We get to Kent Fire and Rescue Headquarters, there's the chief in his beautiful regalia, and the driver gets out and says, this is Jill Hicks, and I'm not bloody taking her home. <laughs> so I haven't done that to the Hawke Centre, and, you know, of course, best behaviour. My continuing journey, my thoughts, my actions my work, everything I am today, and indeed everything I've been able to achieve has been shaped and informed by choosing life. For me, in facing my own death, I've learnt a lot about life, about what is important and indeed what isn't. I've learned about the amazing and often breathtaking ability of my body to survive beyond all the odds and continue not just enabling me to live, but to lead a full and vibrant life. I've learnt about the power of choice, of understanding our individual responsibility in life, the importance and indeed lack of importance of identity and the transformational outcomes brought about by our ability to empathise. I've watched and studied my greatest role models, the paramedics, the nurses, the doctors, because for them, everybody is treated as equal. Um, I was recently very uh, suddenly taken back to hospital in December at Christmas time. And um, once again, it was a very interesting um, insight for me to witness the, the, the nurses in action. Um, and two little just funny asides. So I was back in the ward and I was rushed in and my surgery was at 1 a.m. So in the middle of the night, it was quite disruptive to the rest of the ward. And there was a lady next to me who also had had uh, a double amputation uh, that week, operation that week. Anyway, so I, I wake up the next morning. And of course, I need to have my coffee. So I transferred into my wheelchair. I was a bit groggy, but able to do that. And wheeled over to the bed next to me and said to this woman, can I get you anything from downstairs? And she was just looking at me and said afterwards to the nurses, she came in at 1am and had her at legs amputated. How could she be off getting coffees? You know? And I wish I could have kept that one going, you know, but sadly she was, no, she's just in for a little, for a little tweak. But, but anyway, this, this same woman next to me in the middle of the night, in great pain, and she'd be calling out and cursing at the nurses and saying that they were the antichrist and why are you doing this and why are you punishing me? 
And it was really quite harrowing. And I said to this one young nurse, who must have been maybe 19, I said, how, how do you do that? How do you do that day in and day out? And she just looked at me and said, well, that could be my gran. She didn't need to say any more. I thought that was, that was absolutely wonderful and taught me a lot yet again. Um, it was the same, same woman who um, then would give me a great big smile and a hug. And when we left, she said, I hope I'm going to be able to walk like you can. And I thought, what a great responsibility it is on me to ensure that I'm always upright and mobile. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my beginnings, um, about my first big leap into the unknown, which was shortly after my parents died. Uh, they died a, a year apart from each other. And then I believed that tragic things, like death, happened to other people. It happened to someone else, somewhere else. That for me and those I loved, of course, we, we live forever. Um, I couldn't imagine a world different than what I knew. But there I was, a young girl facing life without the guiding hand and the safety net that parents provide. Now, I had an older brother, which was wonderful, because I wasn't completely alone or without another who shared my DNA. But it's not the same as having a mum, because a mum is the only person in the world who can make everything all right with just a cup of tea. And her death unleashed a real stirring in me that I wanted to shake everything up like a giant snow globe and run, run as fast and as far away as I could. I wanted to know, you know who I really was, what I was made of, maybe even reinvent myself and become Gigi Fontaine or Jill Lahix, something fabulous. You know, change then was welcome. The unknown was embraced, and in fact, it was being summoned. I wasn't scared of what I didn't know, and in fact, the ignorance and naivety were my greatest assets and protective shields. And so, I left Australia, bound for London, not knowing a soul, and that was 20, or well, nearly 20 years ago, and um, I'm still there. <laughs> just forgot to come home somewhere along the line. Uh, now, I think we've shared, or we're all feeling quite intimate as a group tonight, aren't we? So I don't mind perhaps revealing with you um, a very personal story, quite an embarrassing story, but I think it illustrates just how innocent and naive I was in, a, in an endearing way. So, there I was, uh, landed at Heathrow, and I noticed the very heavily armed police and mi military presence. Um, London was on alert with the IRA terrorist threats at the time. So I strolled straight up to one of the uh, army officers and asked, you know, um, what's the best way to get into central London? And he sort of looked blank with his great big AK-47 or whatever they carry, and he sort of looked at me, I think a bit annoyed as to, why, why are you asking me directions? Don't I look fierce and, you know, I, I'm fighting terrorism. And he just looked at me and said, take the tube. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, the tube? Yeah, straight to central London. Yeah, obviously didn't want to know. So I stood for a moment and thought, I was trying to imagine, what, what is this futuristic wind tunnel that somehow transports people? <laughs> And I said to him, but I have luggage. I, I mean, how am I going to hold on to my luggage? And, and it's really heavy. And, and what if I get separated from it? And, and it's all I have. And he sort of walked away. <laughs> um, now, once I realized that a tube was the underground train, um, I did laugh at myself. But in my defense, this was my unknown world somewhere that I imagined was magical and, and filled with so many new experiences. So a wind transporter seemed perfectly logical. 
Now, the innocent and chatty, wide-eyed girl soon became a savvy and toughened Londoner, knowing the unwritten rules of commuter travel, which are no talking, no eye contact, head down, and move in formation. <laughs> the tube was a uniquely silent place, unique because of the thousands who travel in it, but never really speak. It was normal to be pressed up against someone and not even know what they looked like. Now, I was only five foot two, so I would never really get to see anyone's face anyway, um, except my head would always be stuck in their armpit. <laughs> or you get the double whammy of the armpit and the nostril stream of it. Yeah, it's not. So it's good to have a fringe if you're five foot two and commuting in London. On the morning of July 7, 2005, I was again tightly squeezed into a carriage. A series of events conspired to ensure that I boarded the tube at the same time as a suicide bomber. Time, or timing, was everything. If I was a minute later, I may not have been on that train. Indeed, if I was a second earlier, I may have stood in a different position, and that could have cost me my life. That day, I was uncharacteristically late. That day, I left the house angry. That day, a catalogue of events conspired to ensure that I was where I was, on a train that I never usually take, at a time that I'm never usually there. Now, I was quite small, as I've said, and, and quite sprightly. So there I was, weaving through King's Cross Station, running up escalators, defying the gracefulness of the mass commute. I was not going to miss the next train, not for anyone or anything. I was pushed aside, and the doors closed. I cursed at the blonde man who took my spot in the train, watching his face pressed up against the glass as the, as the carriage went down into the tunnel. And I was absolutely determined that I would never be pushed aside again. The next train was mine. So with great gusto, I secured my place on that very next train. It was just seconds out of King's Cross, and the time it takes to draw a breath or click your fingers, my life and those around me changed forever. I didn't know that the man squeezed up tightly against me would become my protector. He, like me, was just on his way to work. I didn't know that in shielding me, he would lose his own life. I didn't know that on the other side of him, tightly placed, just like me, was the suicide bomber. I didn't know then what I know now. It was roughly an hour until rescue could reach us. 60 minutes. 3,600 seconds to sit in our surreal surrounds. And the only really, I guess, uh, clear way that I can share that with you is that if we could all just for a moment imagine that we're sitting here in the town hall and then the time it takes to click your fingers, we're suddenly all in the River Torrens and we have no idea how we got there but suddenly we're all looking at each other and we're all suddenly responsible for each other's lives. That time has been the most profound hour of my life and, as I've just said now, the most difficult to really articulate and share. But I was given a choice, an amazing choice, to go with death or to choose life. Death came to me in the form of a very beautiful voice. 
it was female. And it was the most beautiful voice I have ever heard. And it urged me to just close my eyes and just go. That it, it was like being asleep, except it was forever. And as I contemplated this wonderful, wonderful idea of this peaceful and beautiful place, and to go with this very beautiful voice, knowing that my legs were indeed gone, another voice spoke to me, the voice of life. And it was angry. And it said, how dare I for one minute think of giving up? So I thought about everyone I loved. I was curious about all there was to come, how my future was unwritten, and there was more for me to do. Once again, the best way for me to describe this is to describe the entire experience as firstly a choice to live, but also that a new contract was being presented for me to sign. And I couldn't read the small print, but I knew instinctively that my life would be devoted to making a difference and nothing would ever be the same again. I didn't fear death. In fact, I understood that by choosing life, I was actually choosing the more challenging option. But equally, life was not to be feared. Once the choice was made, miraculously, my body took over and I found myself doing extraordinary things and behaving with amazing confidence. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful story, uh, one of my fellow survivors called Hannah, um, sadly had her back broken, but she was laying on, the, on, the, on what remained of the floor of the carriage. And she told me that the only person that she was transfixed on was me, because I looked like I knew what I was doing. And she said that that gave her a real sense of relief, that everything would be all right and not to panic. Now, of course, you know, you've, you've smiled at this. We, we both laugh hysterically now that she knows me. Um, because, you know, imagine the most unimaginable, indescribable scene and me looking like a professional survivor. Um, now, I did, you know, I, 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 you know, I did managed to tourniquet up the tops of my legs with my scarf and lower my breathing and keep myself upright. So I guess maybe I did look like I know what I was doing, but bare grills I am not, let me assure you. Um, oh, I remember vividly seeing that torch and, and that sign that, that we were rescued. And I could feel myself just surrendering to the paramedics, knowing that I had done everything I could, and now my life was in their hands, and I trusted them completely. And there was a touch on my shoulder, and the words, priority one, were yelled out. And um, now, I didn't know what a priority one was, but it does sound a lot better than a two or three, doesn't it? So, <laughs> all good here. Um, it was only when I was truly awake, uh, really awake, some weeks later, that I found my identity bracelet, the one that was on my wrist when I was admitted to hospital, and it read, one unknown, estimated female. You're not meant to laugh at that bit. <laughs> I know, I could do with a boob job, but you know. Finances haven't allowed. Um, it was reading those words that a, a true picture, though, was revealed. That I actually had experienced the brilliance of humanity. That people had risked their lives to save mine, one unknown, not knowing who I was. And that it didn't actually matter. It didn't matter if I was male or female. It didn't matter if I had a faith or no faith at all. It didn't matter if I was rich or poor. Indeed, if my name was Gigi Fontaine or Jill Le Hicks, nothing mattered except that I was a precious life. 
And I was reminded uh, today at lunch of, um, of, of, I mean, there are, there are thousands of things I wish I had the time to share with you all that are very, 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 very special and very precious. Um, but I was reminded today at lunch about one of my uh, rescuers called Aaron. And Aaron left the, um, left the army uh, because he didn't want to serve in Iraq. And he joined the police force in London, of course, never expecting that he'd have to attend a scene like July 7. And he was a young boy, he was only 24, and he held my hand throughout the entire rescue. And we're quite good friends and quite close, and I, I said to him, Aaron, it felt like you were giving me some of your life. And he said, that's exactly what I was doing. I didn't want you to die. And so I was willing you to live. And when he handed me over, um, I was a little bit like a human baton, I guess, that morning, being passed from one person to the next. And when he handed me over, um, he said his heart broke because he thought he had to let go of my hand and that I would die. And so when he uh, found out that indeed I'd lived, he just couldn't, couldn't believe that, that I was here, and indeed that I was um, female. Um, huh. Anyway, but, but who I was actually was important. My identity unlocked the vital information that was needed to find my next of kin because my life was still very much uh, hanging in the balance. Uh, James, a, a beautiful uh, young Scotland Yard detective, was put in charge of finding my identity. And he tells me time and time again just how hopeless that job seemed. And because there was this little battered body, uh, blackened, and as, as, as my armband suggests, very, very hard to identify, indeed, my sex. And he said he exhausted every avenue. And the only one that was left to him, he felt, was prayer. So he stood over my body and he prayed. And as he stroked my face, my eyes flickered. And in that moment, he came up with a rather genius plan that if I could blink at the letters, if he slowly went through the alphabet to spell my name, then he could find my identity. So it started. A. B. And he just didn't know if I'd respond. And it, it wasn't until we got to G that I was sort of blinking <laughs> madly. And he thought, well, it is working. Um, I mean, we have since had an hysterical laugh, and it depends on how many drinks we've had at the time, but we've said, I said, imagine if my name was Anastasia Giannarikolopoulos, <laughs> and then I said, actually, James, if I'm ever involved in another incident, I think I might blink Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and he said, if you survive, Jill, I'd blink lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, in becoming known, in being Jill Hicks, I had a, now a long list of attachments that I lived in North London, that I worked at the Design Council, that I was an Australian national, and suddenly my world began to form back around me. I couldn't speak, I could barely hear, I couldn't move, but I knew that I was alive and that I had survived and I was absolutely euphoric. The pieces of my survival puzzle were being put in place with new bits of information almost daily. Uh, one doctor telling me uh, how unique I was, not only to be alive, but to not have suffered any, any uh, brain injury because I had been technically gone for 28 minutes and I'd lost over 75% of my blood and had suffered three major cardiac arrests. So they held very little hope, and I guess the most chilling information was when I was told that I'm actually only here by 30 seconds. The resuscitating team all agreed to call time of death if I hadn't come back within a further three minutes, 30 seconds of resuscitation. There was no output on the monitor, and just after three minutes, a beat appeared. So, 
here by 30 seconds is something I still think about. And as you can imagine, I hold the seconds of time with great value. I arrived at hospital, uh, as I said, virtually, I was, uh, they wanted to pronounce me dead at, at the scene. But it was the wonderful paramedic who was with me in the ambulance called Brian, who urged the teams at the hospital not to give up. He, he told them that, look, okay, there's no vital signs, there's no output. So for all intents and purposes, I'm not here. But I was talking in the ambulance. And so apparently, as Brian tells me, he was shouting out to the driver of the ambulance, dead but talking, <laughs> dead but talking. And now he knows me very well. Now this is all making a lot of sense with the film, by the way, isn't it, now I'm telling you this. Um, he knows me very well, Brian, and he said, of course, why would I let being dead stop me from saying a word? <laughs> um, I was in hospital for three and a half months, and for every day there was a story, a, a hilarious incident, a reinforcing experience of the greatness of people, of empathy, and I wish, I really do wish I could share every single one of those extraordinary stories and moments with you. It was overwhelmingly for me dignity, both being given back to me, but also finding it within myself that helped me enormously through those first few weeks and indeed months. Nurses knowing the importance or the difference that just having a shower can make, or the enlightened nurse who bundled me up on a food tray. I was actually that small and it weighed about five stone. And um, just as a quick aside, I remember my, my young nephew coming to the hospital, being flown in from Australia, coming to the hospital, and his only concern was how thin I was. And I managed to look at him and say, darling, that's nothing to be worried about, you know? <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, <laughs> Anyway, there I am, little five stone me on a food tray, then being put on a wheelchair and taken to, you'll never guess where I was, I was being taken to, the hairdressing salon in the, in the ground floor. Now, this was the very first time, so I was still in intensive care and I had all the things hooked up to me, but this was the very first time that I got to see myself in the mirror. And it was strange because somehow, I felt normal, um, that, that the hairdresser actually asked me, where's my parting? I couldn't believe that. And I was almost waiting for the next sort of chitter chatter of going somewhere nice for your holidays, love. And, yeah. <laughs> it, it was just amazing, amazing. Someone was with me every step of the way, encouraging, knowing when to hold my hand, and equally, and importantly, knowing when to let go. They were there to teach me everything because I had to start again. Everything was a new learnt action, from sitting up to transferring my body from a wheelchair to a bed, and indeed to standing again, balancing on prosthetic legs and facing my fear and hoping like hell that I could actually do this. I've had to have complete faith and trust in the team around me. And actually, that was the easy part. The unexpected hardest part of learning to live in my, what I call life number two, was trusting myself. Believing, focusing, and knowing that if I fell over, which I did all the time, that I had to brush myself off and just start again. Now, it helped that my main physio, Matt, was actually a very good-looking guy. Um, and it helped because, of course, I spent nearly every day with Matt. And he helped me discover the new role of my bottom. It was no longer something that just looked big in jeans. It was now my propeller and the basis of how I move forward. And Matt used to walk behind me, professionally, of course. <laughs> And he had to hold my rear to check that I was using the correct muscles. 
of, of course. I mean, don't all guys do that? <laughs> and, okay, naughty me, couldn't resist the chance to say, so, uh, do you fancy me? <laughs> and poor him. I mean, he, he did survive and he's still a physio and he still works at the hospital, which is just amazing. Bravo, Matt. Um, funnily enough, actually, being Australian also crept into my new life. My brother, who was flown over by the government and courtesy of, of the wonderful Qantas, helped with my re rehab and he was given the name Captain. So the English-Australian competitiveness was being played out in the physio gym. Uh, but with me, the non-sporty, non-beer drinking, non-tanning, non-swimming Aussie. Great. And Matt would sort of professionally and wonderfully suggest, what about just five push-ups and five gentle sit-ups, Jill? And Captain, my brother, would veto that and say, what? She can do 20 of those. And then he'd look at me, as big brothers do, and he'd say, don't let me down, all right? <laughs> I'm in constant awe of my body, not only in its self-healing, but in, in its ability to walk and to do all I do every day. Um, as you can see, I, I talk about myself very much in the third person because I am. I, I look at things objectively and think, wow, how do you do that, Jill? Um, now, when Matt was teaching me outside techniques like walking on uneven pavements or the rather daunting crossing a road, my brain, now this is unbelievable, my brain would just shut down and not allow me to step off the curb. It viewed this as an unsafe move. And it was just an amazing experience that sheer willpower alone still wouldn't budge me. So I'd be just stood there at the curb going, <coughs> and my legs wouldn't move. Um, so Matt had to rewire the brain, if you like, and, and put me into a manual setting so we were able to get me across a road. Um, it's quite frightening, actually, to think and wonder in those moments if crossing a road, something that we all take for granted, will ever be possible again. And for me, even preparing this talk and thinking about those milestone moments, it's really impressed on, upon me how far um, I've come in, in five and a half years. My consultant did tell me that I'd walk out of hospital now, as you can imagine, I found that very hard to digest, yet alone believe. But, as he said, I did walk out of hospital, albeit wobbly and uncertain, but I was upright and proud. I left hospital a richer person than when I arrived. The unconditional love that I had felt throughout my rescue was carried through to my hospital experience. I left hospital richer and taller, standing five foot seven. <laughs> I didn't think it was actually necessary to tell them I was five foot two. <laughs> um, um, becoming known in my unknown world has, has mostly been brilliant, and my path has been lit by just extraordinary people guiding me and showing me the way that my contract is being honoured by me devoting my life to building a sustainable peace. And the way I have found to do that is to remind people that we have a choice. In every situation, we have the power to choose how we want to react. And to build a life in which we can all live with confidence takes individual responsibility. I absolutely respect the platform and the stage that I have been given and the importance to reach people. I'm not here just giving a talk. I'm, I'm here with the aim to reach and touch everybody I speak to, no matter where in the world or who is listening and using my life to make a difference, especially making a difference to other lives, is paramount. 
I still live in London, but I am now more frequently in Adelaide, and I have invented a whole new place, and it's called Lunderlade. <laughs> I'm actually hoping, Governor Scarce, that you might be interested in taking it on as a... Yeah. <laughs> but I fit very much into the wonderful saying that you can take the girl out of Australia, but not the Australian out of the girl. And I don't know about any of you, but I still, I just cry every time I hear, I still call Australia home. And it's even if it's the rotten panpipe version in a lift, it just <laughs> sets me off. So you can imagine, as, as Elizabeth said in my introduction, you can imagine the overwhelming pride when I stood to receive two amazing accolades. Australian, an Australian Woman of the Year in the UK. Um, so David Attenborough was awarded Honorary Australian of the Year, and I guess I should have twigged uh, when I was placed next to him at the awards table. He and I were engrossed in conversation, particularly about the movement of the North Pole, but that's a whole other talk. Um, <laughs> And it was surreal. I mean, this is David Attenborough, so David Attenborough. And I just wanted to memorize every second, every gesture, to just sit and listen to him. I mean, you can imagine the table talk of, ah, yes, the bread roll. <laughs> a well-known source of fiber and commonly eaten as an accompaniment to a main meal. Thanks for that, because, you know, it is hard. Um, and as the, so the shortlist was being announced, and, and I, of course I'm still in deep conversation with, um, with Sir David, and, and then the winner, you know, my name, is announced. And Sir David had to say, I believe you've just become Australian of the Year, my dear. <laughs> yeah, shocked. I wobbled to the stage, and of course had nothing prepared, I wasn't expecting this at all. And what came from my mouth was just what I felt in my heart. As the tears rolled down my face, and they're going to start in any minute now, I said that this honour helped me to fill the soil of my homeland again. For it was only when I returned to Australia, six months after the bombings, that it hit me that never again would I walk on the sand, paddle at the water's edge, wear thongs, fill the grass. I would never leave a footprint on my land again. But I've learnt to feel in other ways. And the recognition from my fellow countrymen and women gave me more than they will ever know. For me, I'm most proud that I'm still Jill, still the girl who looks at the world with childlike optimism, and childlike, as opposed to childish, is very powerful, because life is exciting, and every day is new, and defined by what really matters. But losing my legs is not okay. People losing their lives is not okay. Do I forgive? No. Am I angry? Yes. But I don't hold hatred and bitterness within me. My life is too precious to waste a single moment feeling anything but complete appreciation for all I have and all I have back and all I have to come. There are moments and memories that will stay with me forever. Like only being able to receive water in my mouth by a syringe. And I remember thinking that one day I will once again get to hold a glass and drink the water and I'll savour every single drop. And here we are, nearly six years on, and I still cherish every single glass of water. My anger is used in a positive way as my motivator. I'm often asked, how, but how can you not hate? How can you not feel bitter? 
And my answer is that I was wrapped in love. I don't say this lightly, that the people who saved my life didn't just do that on that day, but their actions have left a lasting impression that has saved my life every single day since. Do I believe peace is possible? Well, firstly, what is peace? Can we have a single definition for it? Is it actually definable? For many, peace is merely a lack of war, of violence, of conflict or unrest. Peace is thought of as utopia, an unreachable ideal, like chasing a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. When I founded MAD for Peace, which is an acronym of, for making a difference, not mad as in you might think I'm crazy, um, my objective was very clear. To think of peace and to communicate peace as a verb, as something we could actually consciously choose to do. I've had the priv great privilege of meeting nearly all of those involved in my rescue. And when I've gone to thank them for all they've done, I mean, how do you thank people for, for those types of actions? But I always get the same reply, and that is, I was just doing my job. That's really made me think about, do we all have a job to do? And what is our role in our lives? I'm always coming back to being reminded and reminding myself that someone, somewhere, is feeling the effects of something you have said or done. And it is our responsibility to ensure that that effect is positive, or if it can't be positive, that it's constructive. Isolation, division, ignorance and fear are all able to be overcome, I believe, through communication, empathy and confidence. As Elizabeth said, in 2008, I walked 475 kilometers. I did have a lot of gin and tonic, by the way, so I was <laughs> not held responsible, just kept going. Um, but it was, a, it was a mad project called Walk Talk. And there's a very, very simple theory to it. And it relied on humanity to make it work. And my message was, if I can do the single most difficult thing for me, which is to walk, then perhaps you could do something pretty difficult for yourself. And that is, cross the road and talk to your neighbour. Or talk and walk with someone who you believe your views are different from. My belief in humanity was never let down, not once. And we went through 22 towns and cities. I now have an adopted mother. I have members of new families. Um, it was quite incredible, taken into people's homes. Um, and there's one amazing example that I'd just like to share. And that was there was a, a, a Muslim man and a non-Muslim woman. And they have lived across the road from each other for 10 years. And I overheard the woman saying to the man, well, you lot don't like women, so I don't ever talk to you. And his reply was, well, what rubbish. Of course I like women, but I don't talk to you because I sense you don't really want me to, that you fear me. And I don't know what was said after that, but they chatted for about 10 minutes. And the only thing I heard at the end of their conversation was that they were both annoyed at the rubbish in the front of number 15. And I thought, <laughs> they found their commonality. And it was absolutely brilliant. Um, commonality, empathy, finding ways in which we can step into each other's shoes is key to, to MAD's mission. Indeed, it's very powerful me, for me to be using that as a metaphor to say, who would like to step in my shoes? For the past 18 months, we've been developing a network uh, system called MAD Nests. And it's a structure where individuals and groups can communicate virtually or physically 
to exchange their ideas about creating positive and lasting sustainable change. Our Nest, work, our Nest Network was actually inspired um, by the very highly effective terrorist cell networks used by many extremist groups. And um, I sat with a former um, extremist and, and said to him, you know, this is just so brilliant. I mean, it costs very little money. You manage to have a, a wide reach internationally. How do you do it? And he sat and explained it to me. And I thought, well, we could do that but change the messaging. And so that's what we've done. And it launches um, with University College London in um, May, later this year, later next month, sorry. The greatest difference, of course, is our belief in people wanting to create better lives, better environments through positive and constructive connections. In facing death and choosing life, is something I hope none of you will ever have to know. In closing, I would like to leave you with some words and some thoughts. Firstly, from a 15-year-old Adelaide boy named Yuli. He recently said to me, he feared there would be another major world war because we are too busy worrying about ourselves and we've forgotten to take care of others, that we must work together because our greed will be our downfall. And the great and wise Gandhi, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. And one I'd love to leave you on, which is live as you were to die tomorrow. Learn as you were to live forever. Thank you so much. We will have a formal vote of thanks a little later, but I know we're all quite moved, very moved. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. We do have some time, not long, for questions. Um, we've got two microphones at the top and we've got two here. So if anyone would like to ask a question, would you like to proceed to the microphone? Thank you. And can we have questions, please? Thank you. <laughs> can I ask if you've had any contact with the family of the bomber and any contact with the family of the man who shielded you? If I've had any contact with the family of the bomber, no. Um, and that's, that's been very much my choice as, as well, um, that I don't necessarily think of him and his family. I've thought of him, and his name was Jermaine, as very much um, a, um, I guess, a, a, a I can't think of the exact word for it and, and be polite. Um, <laughs> he's dead, and so he's, he's out of my, my thoughts. Um, the man that shielded me, yes, I do know his family, and um, graciously, his wife, um, which I, I don't know if I would ever have the courage to do. He left behind two little children, and his wife very graciously said to me, if this was the last thing that he's done with his life, which is to save yours, then he would be so proud. And, um, you know, what do you say to that other than uh, we've hugged each other? And I think all we ever do when we meet up is, is just hug each other. And his wife indeed uh, hooked up and joined us on the walk. And her little children had a chance to meet with um, some Muslim communities. And it was just very moving that there were these little kids, I think they were eight and five, um, who had the opportunity to say, why do you hate my daddy? And why was he killed? And for a community, of course, which is, is just harrowing that this is, has come, this ideology has come out of this, and you, know, you, can't, you can't 
use a broad brushstroke across a whole group of people for the actions of a few. And it was wonderful for the interaction and the exchange to happen and for these children to understand that you know it's not Muslims that hated their father. Um, it's a very small group of people that have done this. So um, yeah, it's very, very important for me to, to always honor. Um, and I haven't used his name tonight for very deliberate reasons out of respect for him, but um, I think of him often. I think, do we have someone up the top? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes uh, Jill, I'm an international student from UNSA. Um, instead of asking you a question, uh, I want to thank you, because uh, you, what you said today reminds me of uh, a, lyr a lyrics from Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston, that is, um, uh, there can be miracle when you believe. Though hope is real, it's hard to kill. And thank you. Uh, it really encouraged me. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. A comment. Um, have you written a book that we could perhaps access? I have, yes. The book's called One Unknown. Um, and it was published in 2007. And I think it's still available at all good bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> Shamsul. Yeah. Just a brief query. Your unique experience and uh, quite encouraging way of choosing life, do you think you would have anything from that experience and uh, reaching out also to convince us a suicide bomber the how to choose life, under what circumstances, why he should or she should choose life? How do we speak? How do we send the message about choosing life? Um, I think that's an excellent question and, and the only way that I, the work that I do, the only way I can sort of really talk um, and be effective is by being the living example of. And I think the great uh, confusion or if you like the, the point of, of entry for me is that I don't hold hatred or bitterness and that's what's being expected. Um, when I talk about, because of course uh, you know, the thing that with the suicide bombers is they're dead. So we can only really um, speculate and assume of their own personal journey to becoming and acting in that way. Um, and my own presumptions from doing a lot of work in this area is that it's based on wanting change. And my very, very strong um, discussion points are always around if you want to see change in the world, be alive to see it. Because by Jermaine Lindsay killing himself on the morning of July 7 and taking my legs, it hasn't changed anything. Um, it hasn't said about the change that he would have, I, I hope, in his heart, um, thought he would. And um, I think that that's the greatest message, really, to say, if you want to see change in the world, be around to see it. And, um, and it takes a lot of courage to live. Uh, I was just wondering, like, um, as a young person in society today, it's easy to sort of feel um, really bogged down and, like, we don't have the power to make a difference. But what role do young people um, play, particularly in continuing a movement for peace, and how can we inspire the first part of that is the wonderful speech, isn't it, of that you are the future. You are the generation um, that perhaps can mop up some of the mistakes that we have made. However, um, I'm a great believer in today, in the now. And that means that you and I, that both generations, are in this now together. So in fact, what we do today actually does create the change. So I think for young people to be aware is the most brilliant thing. And as we saw, as I read out tonight, for a 15-year-old to be aware and conscious of what is happening in the world, I think then we just need to move that one step further to say, well, what can you do? What can you do to affect your own lives? Because that's really all we can do. I can't change, or I can't personally make peace in the Middle East. But I can make a peace within my own life. And if we all did that, then you know, it doesn't take much to look at the theory and beautiful planning of that to say, actually, multiply that out. We've, we've got something here. We can start to build 
peaceful neighbourhoods or empathetic communities and therefore cities and therefore countries. So I believe it's possible, but it has to start with each individual. And, and that doesn't matter how old you are. Today is what's important. Um, we're very lucky in Australia to have a very free media relative to the rest of the world. However, this can be used in a way that is not productive and does create fear. What message would you give to the media about uh, creating peace and how to uh, facilitate that starting in Australia? That's an excellent question um, because I think with anything it's important to be balanced but I think once again we've got to take responsibility for what we read and what we absorb. So something I like to do is to read a whole spectrum of things so therefore I get you know, the same story but lots of different opinions and then I can form what I think about that. Now I'm, I appreciate we don't always have all the time in the world to do that but once again it's just I think trying to be open and being aware that perhaps everything you might read in one particular newspaper or one headline might not be the exact facts, but might be tailored to that readership. Um, but I think, I think we have individual responsibility for everything. We can't necessarily just say, oh, well, it's the media's fault, or it's the government, or it does come down to us. I saw on a website on forgiveness your face and that you had forgiven, but tonight you said you hadn't. I, I've never said I've forgiven. So I'm involved in that project because a dear friend of mine set that up. But, it, but equally, I thought it was very interesting to be involved in something and to, to say that I don't forgive. And so what I have said in, involved in that project was that I wish the world would stop. And that's my greatest wish, just it would stop. And for us all to have a good look, a good, long, hard look of what we're doing to each other. And um, I think forgiveness, for me personally, is something that's very removed. The person who's done this to me is dead. I think I would be perhaps put into a very different situation had he lived, if he wanted my forgiveness. I think they're very different things. But for me now, I've been able to separate an idea of forgiveness. I haven't needed to feel forgiveness to move on. I think what was important for me was to just feel a lack of hatred and if I can put that even a better way, to be filled with personal love, which has just shielded me from everything. Thank you. Just a couple of points before I invite Professor Alawalia to give the formal vote of thanks. If you would like to join our mailing list, uh, and access our podcast at the same time, please go to the Hawke Centre website. And I think um, we haven't got the address up there, but if you, if you Google us, you'll find us, or go to the University of South Australia homepage. I'd like to mention that our next major lecture will be held in this venue uh, on the 9th of June. It will be the 14th annual Hawke Lecture, and it will cover the topic of international criminal trials, a promise fulfilled, question mark, to be delivered by the Honourable Dame Sylvia Cartwright, former Governor General of New Zealand, and now trial judge in the Khmer Rouge trials in the courts of Cambodia on behalf of the United Nations. She is an expert in victim experience, uh, and I commend her to you. So without further ado, uh, can I ask Professor Aluwalia to give the formal vote of thanks and thank you all for coming. Thank you, look, uh, Jill, thank you very much for a, a wonderful talk and I made lots of notes um, while you were speaking and as I heard you I realised how banal they were and that I could never even imagine what what you've been through or, or to appreciate, uh, you know, the generosity with which you've shared your experience. So I'm going to spare everybody what I was going to say. And I, I, I thought the generosity that the audience showed when um, you got up and gave that wonderful standing ovation. 
spoke more than anything that I would want to say. But I do want to say a couple of things about what we're trying to do at the university, and particularly in our International Center for Muslim and Non-Muslim Understanding, which I think goes to the heart of what Jill is trying to do in her own way. What we're trying to there, do there is to say that if we can promote that kind of understanding, we will never have another bombing of that sort. We will never have another Jill Hicks get up on stage and have to tell us that experience. I think what we're trying to do is genuinely promote understanding between different communities um, that make up this wonderful multicultural society. And I think making a difference, which is what you know, you're, you're really trying to do here, is something that we're, we share with you in, within the center. So with, you know, without sound, sounding uh, trite and, and banal, I, I don't want to go ahead, but just to say, on behalf of everybody here, it was a fantastic talk. We really appreciate it. Um, and you really are a true international hero for us. So thank you very much. Just, we'll just close by saying thank you to everybody and we look forward to seeing you in June at our annual Hawk Lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>